Jean-Pierre, the floor is yours. Seven minutes. All right, I look at the time. And there's a clock here. Well, thanks a lot uh, for this very kind introduction. Thank you to Thierry de Montbrial and Ifri for inviting me again to this uh, August uh, um, conference um, in which I I've learned a lot on other topics like AI and semiconductors, which are very, uh, re very much related to the topic we're going to talk about. We are located actually uh, uh, at the western end of the Indo-Pacific region, a region which is very vast, which uh, includes maybe two-thirds of the world population and, and maybe more than half of the uh, world GDP. So it's a very, very important region of the world. Even in Europe sometimes, of course, we tend to, I wouldn't say neglect in the Pacific, but we are so focused on Europe and Ukraine for good reason, and also uh, on the Middle East for uh, uh, obvious reasons as well, that uh, the Indo-Pacific maybe is not at the top of the, of the, uh, of the agenda of uh, a lot of, uh, of most, most European uh, leaders and governments. Um, however, I think there are a number of things that we'd like to uh, tell you about, very briefly to start with. Uh, since I'm based in Hong Kong, which is part of China, as you may have realized, realized um, I, I would like to say a few things about, first of all, the, the new uh, environment in, in, in the Indo-Pacific, and in particular the economic environment in which uh, the region is, uh, um, is um, uh, um, uh, is developing today. It's a much slower um, ec um, uh, economic uh, environment than before. The economic growth of China has slowed down to 3%. The Chinese economy is facing a number of issues in the housing sector. Um, local governments are in, in the red. Um, and the post-COVID uh, recovery has been quite disappointing. It, it worked well in the first uh, term of this year, but then it has slowed down and there are some concerns. There are also some concerns about uh, employment in China. The unemployment rate officially is around 21%. Maybe it's much higher among, the, uh, for, among young people, maybe 40%. And there's a sense of malaise. If you have a, haven't read an article by Evan uh, Osnos in the uh, New Yorker, which is a very interesting uh, magazine, and the article tells you quite a bit about the mood of, some, of uh, quite a number of Chinese today. And I can see that among my many Chinese students in Hong Kong itself. So, um, so that's the first thing I would like to say. The second thing is, of course, geopolitics is having an impact on, on, on the economy of those uh, uh, in, the, in the region, particularly on the Chinese economy. Um, it's not disrupting everything. Uh, I don't think we, we're witnessing a full decoupling of uh, Chinese and the economy from the U.S. economy or Western economies, uh, but it's disrupting. It complicates uh, the uh, trade flows in a number of sectors. Uh, semiconductors has been mentioned, but also China has uh, retaliated against the sanctions imposed by the U.S. and uh, has, decided, uh, has started to use also some uh, 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 economic and, and, and uh, tools in order to put pressure on the other side, including restricting the export of uh, gallium, germanium, and graphite to, 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 to the US and to other countries as well. Now, what is interesting in this new context is you see both trends uh, taking shape. One is uh, some kind of um, um, uh, reduction of uh, some countries dependent upon China, and one of these examples is South Korea. We may come back to that. And uh, the, on the other side, we see uh, countries like India, despite the tensions you've alluded to on the border, they still do a lot of trade with China. And uh, actually, the trade deficit between India uh, and China is, is huge and, and keeps growing to the point that now India trades more with, with, with China than with, with the US. Um, so we, we, we're not really witnessing any, any decoupling. Uh, if you look at the trade figures between China and the US or the EU and the US, is still very, very strong. And then um, the slowdown has had also in China has had other consequences. Um, uh, the fact that the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, now has less steam, uh, less, I mean, in its uh, engine, less money uh, has been involved in, the, uh, invested in the BRI today. I think it gives opportunity to other players to play a bigger role in the Indo-Pacific region and the global south as a whole. I'm alluding here to a number of initiatives taken by the US, like the, the uh, uh, the, the B3W, uh, built by Becker World, uh, or the Global Gateway of the European Union, or the G7 Infrastructure Project. So, so there are a number of opportunities here, um, which is also uh, uh, shouldn't be neglected. But I think there are security challenges. 
Uh, and uh, here I will be uh, brief because we can uh, come back to those challenges. It doesn't mean that every country is aligned uh, to, uh, and, and, and to this new bipolarity, we, 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 uh, with this new bipolarity with, uh, which is emerging in the region between the US and China. I think there's still a lot of uh, leeway for a number of countries, and the best example maybe is India, which is at the same time a very active member of the BRICS, why, as a, well, why, why being much closer to uh, other partners in Asia through uh, the quiet if you never heard of the Quad, the quadrilateral uh, um, security forum between India, uh, Japan, Australia, and the U.S. So we see India playing a you know very um, diverse role in in the region. Uh, but what uh, um, the army nets in the in the Pacific uh, region now it's uh, it's really a growing bipolarity and growing tension between the U.S. and China. And the question, of course, is for other players in the Green European Union whether they can, uh, you know, how, how can they play a role in that new context. Now, the, the good news in the sense that they, uh, is that there, there are tensions, uh, but for the time being, China is uh, playing what, in what we call the gray zone within its, the, gray, the limits of the gray zone strategy, which is to put pressure on the other side, on other players, uh, including the South China Sea, uh, and the Taiwan Strait, and the, even in the East China Sea uh, with Japan around the Senkaku Islands, uh, but doesn't go beyond the threshold of war. So the, the gray zone strategy is not without risks. Uh, I think there are growing risks of incidents, uh, of military crises, uh, and the mini crisis, a military crisis needs to be managed, but I think we have precedents. Uh, one of the best known precedents, the EP3 incident in, in 2001 between the, the US and China, which was you know, uh, negotiated and managed and, and negotiated by both sides of uh, foreign ministry. So, so they, even if today one of the issues, and Doug will come back to that, I'm sure, is the lack of military to military uh, relations and, and contacts between the US and China. Uh, I think those meal meal relations will be sooner or later resumed. And uh, if there is a need to com communicate because of a crisis, I think uh, they will find a way to communicate. Uh, the, so that, that, that's, the, that's the background. Now, the, of course, if, if quite a number of people have uh, alarm about the growing tension in the Taiwan Strait, and for good reasons. And uh, now, I don't think that the um, TSMC and the, and, the, and, the, and the semiconductor industry in Taiwan is an is a efficient shield against any attack from China. The so-called silicon shield is not something which I would really invest in or believe in. But uh, what I think is that uh, a number of factors have also led China to think twice about uh, starting a military adventure against Taiwan. The war in Ukraine is playing a role, clearly. Um, but I think at the end of the day, what is very important to bear in mind is the fact that both China and the US are nuclear powers. And uh, it's very likely that in the case of a Taiwan contingency or a crisis in Taiwan Strait, the US will intervene. So it raises the stakes, clearly. Uh, but as for, uh, the fact that we have two nuclear powers and nuclear weapons, in a sense, are factors of peace uh, rather than factors of war, because it will f compel both sides to think twice before starting a war in the Taiwan Strait. So that's what I, I would uh, insist upon here at this stage, and maybe we can come back to those issues. Uh, Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre.